it's very exciting to be here um, because they've given me, I've given them no hint what I'm going to talk about. So they're sitting there nervously with no idea what I'm going to say. And I am standing here nervously with no idea of what I'm going to say. Um, although I told my wife I was, I was coming out to this meeting today, the .md meeting, which is a really wonderful meeting. I think you'll probably agree it's been really good so far today anyway, and it's really, really well organized and well run. So thanks for inviting me. But I told my wife I was coming here because I was kind of proud of this. I said, you know, I'm going to talk at the .md meeting. I bet never in your wildest dreams did you think I'd be speaking at this meeting. And my wife looked at me with a look of infinite sadness in her eyes. She said, honey, it has been many years since you've been in my wildest dreams. <laughs> Nonetheless, um, um, and not, not, notwithstanding that and the marital, the marital issues that might arise, uh, th th this is just between me and the audience here and everybody on the internet. Isn't that right, Renat? Um, uh, yes, well, notwithstanding that, um, that I, I may have overshared already uh, within my first two minutes, um, I am going to try and tell, tell a story um, about something. Um, and it, it concerns, um, it, well, it concerns me fast asleep in the middle of the night one night, waking up abruptly, consumed with a sudden desire in the middle of the night. And the desire was for some sparkling water. This is a very unusual thing to occur. When I wake in the middle of the night, it's usually not with such a preformed desire. So I leave my house and I went down to a shop just off O'Connell Street because that's uh, near where I live. And I went into a newsagent shop. Now, for those who don't know, that's like a 7-Eleven or something like that at 2 in the morning. Now, has anyone been in a newsagent on O'Connell Street at 2 in the morning? <laughs> I bet none of you have. The first thing is it is crowded with people mainly young people. They've all taken a certain amount of alcohol. Some of them have taken a certain amount of other substances. There are some random people there asleep. There are people drinking alcohol, people selling things to each other. A couple of tourists absolutely baffled by this, thinking they'd wandered into some kind of uh, sort of uh, Dante's Inferno in the middle of Dublin, a city centre. So I stand there holding my, my sparkling water and in totters, a girl, maybe 17 years of age. She's wearing ridiculously high heels, a, a little outfit that suggests she's been to a nightclub or a bar. She's clearly drunk. It's raining and her makeup is running and she's crying and she's hugely distressed in the middle of this horrible, horrible place. And she reaches to the, the shelf and she grabs five boxes of paracetamol and joins a queue to pay. And I stand there rooted to the spot because this moment fascinates me. I'm absolutely fascinated by this moment. Just to step back from the story for a moment, I want to talk a little really about suicide and self-harm. Um, in, 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 in Ireland in 2011, 550 people died by suicide. 550. In 2015, 450. That is a big reduction. That is a reduction of 100 people, a reduction of 19%. That's 450 people too many dying by suicide, just to be clear. Um, but it is a reduction, which is an, ast an astonishing statistic. And we need to think, how does this happen? There's more self-harm, around 11,000 episodes of self-harm, two-thirds of which are overdoses, many involving paracetamol. And when you ask people who take paracetamol overdose, why did you take it? Their first answer isn't, I want to die. It isn't, I felt depressed. Their first answer is, it was right there. It was sitting there, and I took it. So availability is the first answer for 80% of people. So we got regulations, as you know. Does anyone know what happens in a newsagent if you try to buy two boxes of paracetamol? You're not allowed. You're only allowed to buy 12 tablets, and in a pharmacy, 24 tablets. When this regulation was introduced in 2001, the number of paracetamol overdoses fell by 30%. The number of deaths from paracetamol overdose falls by 45%. Now, that is an enormous effect. That is a huge effect. But for this to work, the regulations have to be enforced. So I'm standing there off O'Connell Street in this horrible shop, watching this girl queuing up with her 
uh, five, maybe five packets of paracetamol, and she's moving up the queue. And I'm figuring what's going to happen. Now, as it happens, I know what's going to happen because we did a study of this a few years ago. We went to 100 outlets, and I know that around 50% of news agents do not observe the regulations. I know that 10% of supermarkets do not observe the regulations, and almost 50% of pharmacies do not observe the regulations. So I've got a pretty good statistical idea of what's happening. The pharmacies are the most worrying, obviously. Um, and we did this study. Now, I did this study some years ago with my resident, a junior doctor, and he was a guy called Tom from the United States. He was six foot high. He was, really, he was built like a Marine. He had this, this blonde hair, these beautiful cobalt blue eyes and arms like tree trunks. He was an extraordinary guy, and whenever he went into a pharmacy or a news agent, they gave him anything he wanted. <laughs> <laughs> there, was, there was, you know, anything. I mean, I'd be walking along the street and people would be swooning as we go past, and I, I think that's, that's probably me, but it was almost, almost certainly him, and I could see what they were doing. I, I might be straight, but I'm not dead. Um, <laughs> so, there was a little bit of inter, inter-rater problem with the study, but let's, let's skip that. In, in one of the pharmacies, I was, I was there and trying to buy too much paracetamol, and the person behind the counter hesitated, just a little hesitation, but then went ahead and completed the transaction that they should not have completed. So I, compl I took the tablets and I turned back and I said, hold on, you hesitated before selling me so many tablets. Why did you hesitate? And, um, and he said, I was breaking the regulations. I said, well, well, why were you breaking the regulations? And he said, you don't look like you'll kill yourself. Now, you cannot predict who will take an overdose and who won't, but if you picture this scene, this was a, a suburban shopping center in a pharmacy in the Saturday afternoon. It was really crowded. I was there. I had a buggy with a baby in it. I had another child. I had bags of shopping. I had a backpack filled with bottles and baby equipment. And to him, how did I look? Uh, broken? Um, yes. Um, <laughs> Utterly defeated by life, yes, crushed by all means, but suicidal, no, no, I wasn't. So, so in that instance, he, he was correct, but the regulations don't work like that. And we, we, we wrote about this in The Lancet at the time, and we went back with the regulator, and we, things have improved a little bit. But nonetheless, I stood there in the middle of the night, holding my sparkling water, watching this girl, and I, I, I watched her queue up, and she got to the top, now, what would she do if she wasn't given the paracetamol? That is a question. And we, we don't know, but what we do know is if people are delayed or stopped, the impulsive element of their plan um, is frustrated. And people tend not to switch methods. Uh, for example, if you put a barrier at a bridge where people jump, they don't jump and they don't jump elsewhere. And it looks like they don't switch methods. There's a big impulsive element. And if you can address that, you can reduce harm greatly. So she got to the counter, and the person behind the counter said, you're going to have to queue up four times and buy one pack each time. And that's exactly how the regulations work. It sounds ridiculous when I say it now, but did she queue up four times? Not a hope, not a hope. She took all the packets, she threw them on the floor, she said, oh, Fiddlesticks. Okay. Now, I'm, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit because the organizers have asked me to, to keep it clean. Um, she said, oh, fiddlesticks to you all. And <laughs> this sounds like something from a novel. Uh, <laughs> and, and off she went out onto the street in the rain, in the night, to see her friends. To do what? Maybe to maybe go elsewhere and queue up four times and take a paracetamol overdose? I don't think so. Maybe to drink some more alcohol, maybe to meet up with her friends, maybe to collapse on the street, maybe to have a little vomit, maybe to start an ill-advised relationship on the street. I could see such things happening right in front of me. Not very savoury, any of it, but not an overdose. And oddly, as a psychiatrist, I see a lot of self-harm and you know, people who've considered self-harm and, you know, it, that moment in the shop was, to me, incredibly moving. 
As the years go by, I'm more and more emotionally affected by things like laws and systems that work. The person behind the counter in that shop didn't fully know about the paracetamol regulations, but by sticking to them in, in that moment with that girl, they reduced the chances of her dying by paracetamol overdose by 43%. Now, that, that to me moved me there almost to tears um, because it, it speaks to me of what we can do, not necessarily as healthcare professionals, um, not necessarily in, at the level of individual patient care, but as communities or as societies, that we can do really effective things and really amazing things that are medicinal and therapeutic and reduce risk and help people. So, you know, I, I took my water, I went off home, and um, she went off home too, and presumably we, we both woke up the following morning. Um, and, that's, and that matters, that matters to her, it matters to me, and it matters to all of us. And ultimately, that kind of intervention, um, when you look at deliberate self-harm and look at suicide and depression and so forth, ultimately, ultimately that might be the only thing that matters, that we're capable of doing this when we act together and all, all point the same way. So that's the story that I thought of telling today and trying to put in context a little bit some of the, some of the things that we can, that we can do. Um, although uh, I see, you see, you might know this, but I wasn't the first choice to speak in this slot. I'm going to embarrass the organizers now. I was actually the number two choice, um, but I'm okay with that because my, you know, my wife constantly reminds me that I was her second choice as well. <laughs> and she never, she never tells me who her first choice was. She just refers to him as the one. <laughs> well, I hope you enjoyed this story. That's all I've got to say. Thank you.